Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Paul as well for an uh, insightful talk. Um, I found one of the take-home messages quite interesting that uh, that which you do not understand, you cannot manage. Uh, so it's good that a data company is here to uh, show that we have the information that we need. Um, I'm going to start, though, by saying that my take-home message is that data isn't important. And hopefully, you listening to me try and explain why for the next 10 minutes will be a worthwhile experience. Um, at Landmark, we are based we base our business on property and environmental risk data, and we translate that into insight. So to try and explain to you why I don't think data is important, I'd like to walk through what I think the setting is for the Brownfield debate of today, uh, some thoughts on some of the psychological biases that sit behind the data that we use and how we approach it, and also briefly explore what the solution might need to look like. So what's the setting? Pretty straightforward to illustrate. We've got more people than we have houses. Um, obviously, you can see there is the annual growth in houses in orange and the population growth in green. So we have a divergence appearing, and that's been our reality since the start of this century. And it's only getting worse. I find this graph fascinating, that in the world we live in today, in a day, in a day of more data than we've ever had before, more decision-making power, how is that divergence happening and how is it getting worse? So there's lots of factors that influence that, none more so uh, in evidence than today of all days. Um, but this is a track of the last five decades where there's been a huge amount of stimulus packages set up to, to drive more house building. They range through the 80s from the new ownership programs that was then derailed by a recession and the Pathfinder programs through the 2000s. And there's lots of smaller ones as well that sit around these things. And they all have a role to play in creating the setting for this brownfield debate. Just a tiny bit of detail on the more recent years and some of their um, specific schemes. Paul's point about brownfield registers is interesting that there isn't a brownfield register, I fully agree. There's just scales thereof. Um, but all of the planning and principle changes, all of the activity in recent times is very, very focused on delivering more brownfield sites. You've also got the role of the housing market and the kind of conventional supply and demand di dynamic. Um, we went through periods of actually uh, d not delivering as many houses as we started, which influences the debate. You've also got the economic setting, which is probably the overarching thing in all of this, that this graph absolutely has to follow a standard growth curve model at the expense of all else. So there's lots of influencing factors that range politics, economics, geographies, and the like, and they all have a role to play in creating the setting for this conversation. So how do we solve it? Traditional wisdom would tell us that we resort to data. And when we think about data, we think big. We have more than ever before, more is better, that's how we solve problems. If we have enough, we'll find a way through it and we'll find a solution from it. Uh, out of interest, a show of hands who's heard of big data? Brilliant. Leave your hand up if you can provide a very articulate summary of what it actually means. One hand at the back, excellent, thank you Paul. So that's perhaps symbolic of the challenges that we face when, when we think about data. Uh, so when you look at the growth of data, and then you factor in another compounding effect, which in the corporate world we live in, the decision-making world, I think is a contraction of time. Using the inverse of the growth of data to represent that contraction in time available, you, you see something interesting. I don't think it's coincidence that for the first time last year, we're at a point where we've reached a crossover. We've got a deficit. We have more information than we know how to use it or have time available to use it. And this is real, and it's not going away. It's only going to get worse. So we need to solve this in a sustainable way. Compounding that problem also is the fact that most of the data that we're gathering isn't particularly orderly. Our obsession with more leads us to just collecting things and not really knowing where we're going to put them or how we're going to keep them and how we're going to access them. So this creates a real uh, confusion layer and chaos to the information that we're collecting. So how do we solve that? 
Conventional logic again would dictate we follow Mr. Babbage's footsteps and just rely on computational power. Now this is, a, this is the positive story because that's growing at the same rate as our data. So that's the positive. We have more data than ever before and we have more ability to analyze it and to use it than ever before. So this is a success story, if that's the case. But we're still in deficit. And the deficit is growing. Why is that the case? I think it's because we're humans and we aren't as smart as we think we are unless we think about how we're thinking. Now everyone's had a coffee, so that's a good start. I'd like to just run a very brief exercise to try and explain why that's the case. So let's throw off the social dependence theories in the room and shout, please, the first thing that comes into your head when you think about data. It could be a word, it could be a phrase. What do you think about when someone talks to you about data? Good, okay, that's awesome. At least one person spoke, so that's positive. Um, thank you for that. I think that shows my point that when we think about data, it's all about size, volume, scale, granularity. It's the detail. Not one person said use. What's it for? That's fascinating because that defines what you're looking for in the first place. Data is just facts, figures, information. What's it for? We've lost sight of that, I think, in our quest for big data, what, whatever the definition is that we currently hold for that. And we're not considering what the purpose is before we go and start collecting it. So this is our mountain. I think we need to actually start climbing it instead of being obsessed about staying at the very bottom layer and just collecting all of the data that we have available and that we can get our hands on. If our goal is to climb the mountain, data will only tell us how high it is. Everest is 29,029 feet, I'm informed. But if you can start using that for a purpose, which is to climb it, you can start getting into the level of information, which would tell you potentially what the geology is like, what the weather conditions are going to be. Then you move into knowledge, which could be the most successful route up the mountain, which is the South Coal. Wisdom would probably be, in this scenario, knowing whether to actually climb it or not on any given day. But we need to refocus on the purpose. And we've lost sight of that. So where does Brownfield sit in this debate? It's at least 30% of the answer, according to some reports that came out last year. This illustrates that it's definitely got a use. I think, interestingly as well, it's very widely regarded as the right thing to do. And by that I mean we're talking here at a sustainability conference. Everyone accepts that Brownfield is the start point. So we need to unlock that 30% or whatever the number is before we look at other sites. So sharing Paul's sentiment about defining what the solution needs to look like. We need something that can represent the world we live in today, and that's changeable, evidenced by this morning's news. We need something that can react to all of the forces that are acting in the world in which we're making decisions. We also then need to plug in what we're actually saying Brownfield land is. And this is where the fun starts. I didn't do uh, what Paul did and looked at the legislation guidance. I did what most people do but don't confess to and looked at Wikipedia. And this is what it said. <laughs> so then I also did what people do and are even li less likely to confess to and got a red pen out and underlined the things that are important to remember. And it did that. <laughs> which isn't particularly helpful. So this is a core part of the problem, that we have so many different versions of things. But then I did something that was actually quite helpful, and I looked at what parts of this definition suggest that a brownfield site is, is a fixed entity. It's something contained and definitive. And this is what it did. So it's about 25% of the content. So that made me think that this is all actually a success story, because we definitely know what this, this brownfield site is. We know that we need a solution that's reactive to the setting in which we're applying it. So we can just plug it in. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't actually think that's the case. Because if you follow one particular brownfield site, this could be the, the Olympic site, it could be any of the sites that Paul talked about, and you follow it through its life, lifetime, and this is the lifetime of, of any given site, and you see some of the pieces of information from the various data providers out there that you could go and collect, 
to inform your definition or your use or your scale of how achievable, available, developable that site is. Where on that timeline do we draw a line then to start making our decisions if it's a fixed entity? We don't want to, do we? We want all of it to make the best decision. So that really, really emphasizes the importance of being flexible enough to include these things. And even if we did draw a line, most people would say, well, we need to draw it as far this side as we can be, but then we're not working for tomorrow. We're creating a solution that is only applicable to the time in which you're employing it, and it won't be able to change for the non-EU world, for example. So all of this probably sounds a little bit negative at this point, but this is where I start getting more positive. There is a key to all of this, and it's usability. The only reason I think we're still convinced this is a complicated thing to solve is because we haven't yet seen the solution. So today, we've got some demos and we've got some things to show you, all based around this premise of finding brownfield sites, unlocking them, and trying to deliver them. And we'd like to introduce that to you today. Uh, it's called Land Search. What we think it is is the starting point of a conversation. Because so many different people act in this space, developers, local authorities, regulators, there's not one answer. But I think we can get pretty close to it if we all come together and start talking about what it needs to look like. Um, so we're excited about doing that today. Uh, Land Search is a geospatial platform that hosts a vast amount of data. From that data, you can actually start making decisions about what the scale of a brownfield site looks like, where it sits. So, for example, uh, environmental contamination might be a factor, it might not. You can define where the boundaries sit for all these things. So it's an interactive platform, and it's usable for the individual. So we're really excited about having those conversations today and being part of the debate. Um, to finish, as Paul did, ironically, with a quote from Mark Twain, a self-confessed lunatic, he did actually say some sensible things at some stage when he said that data is a bit like rubbish. You really need to think about what it's for before you start going to get it. And that's my take-home message today, is that let's refocus on the challenge, which is fairly obvious, and let's actually start talking about a solution, because I think it's possible. So thank you for listening, and we look forward to chatting to you throughout the day.